I don't know if you want to do the Egypt rant first, or you want to go um, well to me we'll first. Because I, I have I have a little bit of an Egypt rant. I'm sure you probably have an Egypt rant. Oh, know. oh, give me an Egypt rant. Let, let me give. Let me hear something. Okay. Well, um, my big concern about this is, you know, I frequent a lot of sites that tend to reflect my own value system, as I'm sure you know most people do when they go to sites that, you know, carry news or opinion, you know, uh, obviously they want to find an echo chamber where they can have their own opinion reinforced. Um, right. And, psych- and I'm kind psychologists of psychologists with all this confirmation bias. Go ahead. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, you know, everyone is, you know, I'm big into the confirmation bias thing. I want it fed to me, you know, um, but I'm very, I'm a little bit I don't want to say I'm very perturbed, but I'm a little bit perturbed at the framing of the um, the riots in Egypt. Now, I, uh, you know, I'm always for the usurping of autocratic dictators, which is what, <laughs> you know, yeah, good, yeah, you know, President Mubarak or however you pronounce his name. Obviously, autocratic dictator. Despite what Joe Biden said today, you know, he's not a dictator. Yeah, he is. Um, but I, I think that. People who are just, you know, gung ho for yay Egypt, yay revolution. I, I think they need to to take a step back because I mean, if you look at polls, you know, they, they did this, you know, countrywide poll. I forget what organization did it. It was a, the Pew Global Research. Um, right. They did these polls from Muslim country to Muslim country to, you know, kind of gauge attitudes and gauge levels of extremism. And, you know, Egypt has, seems to have very, very, very bad results for these polls. I'm just going to go through some of these numbers with you here. Um, 49% of Egyptians have a favorable view of Hamas. 20% have a favorable view of al-Qaeda. Only 2% of Egyptians polled feel that Islam having a heavy influence on politics is a bad thing. 59% of Egyptian Muslims see themselves as fundamentalists. 54 per, 50, oh, wait, 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 59 percent see themselves as fundamentalists. Yeah, 54. Oh, my God. OK, 54 percent support gender segregation in the workplace. 82 percent support stoning as a form of punishment for adultery. Ah! 77 77 percent support cutting off the hands of thieves. 84 ah! percent. 84% support the death penalty for apostates, which means someone who is a member of the Islamic faith and then renounces it. So, um, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm looking at the polls from, you know, like, this nation really gives off a vibe of being very extremist. I mean, most countries in the Islamic world do not have polls that lean this far towards this kind of extreme viewpoint, uh, uh, this right. extreme fundy viewpoint of Islam. Uh, you know, in other countries, it's maybe like, you know, 32 percent of people that describe themselves as fundamentalists. So basically about the same as the United States. Um, you in know, words, and most of them, most of them, most of them, most of the Islamic world is not still supporting stoning and, and cutting off people's hands. And so Egypt is a nation of maniacs. Yeah, I mean, they're. They're like, you know, they're like one of the really fringe countries right now, like Afghanistan or Iran. You know, it's it's a very, very far in one direction. Uh, you know, this is not a a, a very modernized in terms of um, of political viewpoints kind of country. I mean, th- this is not this is not a country where social progressive attitudes are uh, are uh, very prevalent. So. No, actually, you're, you're supposed to cut off the heads and the hands of people with socially progressive attitudes. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm, I'm, so I'm, you know, while I'm very happy for Egypt, and I, I think that it's good that they're trying to get rid of uh, a despot, I'm pretty sure that they're just going to end up with a, a new autocratic dictatorship when it's all done. So uh, we'll see. But uh, I'm sure you have your own take on it, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead. No, and... that makes absolute sense to me, because revolutions are a time of opportunity for the worst people in the human race. Um, once upon a time, the Russians had a revolution. And they actually had two of them, 1905 and 19, 1917. And they thought they were going to get liberal democracy. And sure enough, they had a party called the Mensheviks, and roughly translated, that means the majority party. 
And the Mensheviks were in favor of, guess what, a liberal democracy. And the Mensheviks took over in the Duma. They actually had control of the Duma. But because the Mensheviks were the kind of liberal progressives that you and I tend to favor, they were against doing things like cutting people's heads off and cutting people's hands off. Well, there was a guy who was off in Switzerland and had been, not even been in the country for years and years and years, and he did not believe in uh, just taking a vote on things. He did believe in cutting off heads and hands for all practical purposes. And the Germans, spotting an opportunity, gave him an armored train. It was the middle of World War I, put him into that armored train, which cost them a fortune, and drove him through some of the worst battlegrounds around to get him safely to Moscow. Why? To take over the revolution. Why? Because having a man who had cut off heads and hands was very useful to the Germans. Why? Because the Russians were making war against the Germans. And one thing this guy promised to do was he would cut off enough heads and enough hands to, keep the, to get the Russians out of the war with the Germans and free them up on an entire front, their eastern front, so they could pour all their men into the western front and so the Germans could win the war. And there's a remarkable power to people who are willing to use violence to get their ways politically. Um, they, are, they have a force multiplier. Cutting off heads and hands is a way to take, is to give a minority of 5% the power of a majority with 65%. And the result was that this madman, this um, homicidal monster, like the homicidal monsters you're describing in Egypt, um, was able to take over the revolution despite the fact that he had nowhere near a majority, never, ever did. And his name was Lenin. And he gave birth, for all practical purposes, to another guy named Stalin who was willing to cut off even more heads and hands, who was willing to kill between 20 and 40 million people of his own, uh, members of his own country, people, fellow countrymen, in order to get his way, perfectly willing to starve them to death. The monsters took over the revolution in Russia, and the monsters retained control until approximately 1965, when lesser monsters came to the surface. People who only used gulags. Um, and the same thing <laughs> happened and the same thing happened in 1979 in a country called Iran. A whole bunch of liberal progressive Democrats thought they had won the revolution and gotten rid of the Shah. The Shah was a monster, they said. Why was he a monster? Because Savak killed roughly 200 people a year. Well, that's pretty monstrous. And, and they tortured half of those 200 people a year. That's pretty monstrous, too. But the guys who were willing to cut off heads and hands, literally, were able to take over because they had the force multiplier of violence, and they were able to turn a minority of 5% into a majority of 65%. And the result was, who took over the revolution in Iran? Was it the progressive, pro, the, the progressive Democrats who thought they, that it was their revolution and they had won it? No, it was the imams. It was the headloppers and the hand cutters who won the revolution. Revolutions are very dangerous. The American Revolution of 1776 was a rare exception to the rule. And the British Revolution that had preceded it and given revolution its modern name, the Revolution of 1688, the Glorious Revolution, in which the country decided they didn't really care for their king, and they wanted to get a king on contract, who was on contract by signing a contract to the parliament. So the parliament, the representative of as much democracy as England had at the time, because not everybody had the vote, only property owners had the vote. But the king was under con the new king was under contract, and it was a rel it was a peaceful revolution. Well, I'm sorry, bozos, the peaceful re the days of peaceful revolutions are over. The days of peaceful revolutions lasted from 1682 until 1776, and then, I'm sorry, from then on, the guys who were willing to literally cut off the most heads were the guys who took over the revolution. How the hell do we know? Because the next revolution, inspired by the American Revolution, was the French Revolution of 1688. And guess who took over the French Revolution? The guys who used this brand new, high-tech, highly humane device for cutting off heads without a lot of pain, you know, without 20 whacks of the sword before the head finally came <laughs> off, and the head still grimacing with all the pain, rolled into a basket. I mean, still going like, ah! <laughs> I crap! Um, 
See, was that worth the television image? Um, at any rate, uh, that was the French Revolution. And ever since the French Revolution, of, and, and who ultimately took over Napoleon Bonaparte, who was willing to have hundreds of thousands of his people die in battles with anybody who opposed him. Absolutely anybody who opposed him. And from that point on, revolutions have been taken over by those who have used violence as a force multiplier. Even democratic revolutions have been taken over by those who use violence as a force multiplier. How do we know? Because in 1933, there was a little guy who looked like Charlie Chaplin. He was ridiculous. He talked about the glory of the German people with their blue eyes and blonde hair and their magnificent height. And he was a little man who looked like a dwarf. He looked like a gnome. He looked like something out of a, uh, out of a German folktale. He looked like Rumpelstiltskin, for God's sakes. How the hell would he ever take over the country? Well, he didn't have a chance. He ran in the revo- he ran in, in um, a, a election after election, and he never got more than 34 percent of the vote. Sixty six percent of the Germans always consistently voted against him. But he managed to gain control in 1933 with his mere 34 percent majority, with 64 percent voting against him. And then he used violence as a force multiplier. He had claimed that somebody burned down the parliament. We all know today that in all probability, he burned down the parliament in order to take control of the country. And he used it as an excuse and and basically ran rampant through the streets, killing people who were his political enemies, especially people in his own party, the Nazi party. He had a violent purge of his own freaking party to take free and goddamn total control. And, of course, we all know that he was one of the great Democrats and humanitarians and liberals and progressives of history. His name was Adolf Hitler. (laughs) And 64% of the Germans consistently voted against him. Did it do them any good? No, because violence is a force multiplier. So beware of the violent and beware of revolution. Because it starts off looking good, but it ends up looking like a bloody nightmare. So you are right. Don't forget, uh, don't forget Cuba in there. I mean, uh, oh my another God, Fidel Castro. Yes, for the first two and a half years or three years, he presented himself to his people as a Democrat and a progressive, and he presented himself to the American public as a Democrat and a progressive. Wait, let me get my makeup department out here because we're beginning to get glossy in the face. There we go. You've seen makeup done on television by a high-priced makeup staff. <laughs> For one of the first times in television history. Does Tom Brokaw show you that? Um, does John Stewart show you that? No, only we show you <laughs> the magic behind the scenes. <laughs> okay, there we go. Now I don't look like Richard Nixon um, saying, I am not a crook. Ah! Um, all right, talking about monsters. So, yes, but so historically, despite all of my shenanigans here, because I love clowning around, it's great fun with you, um, you're absolutely right. Open the door, the closet door of revolution, and the monsters come out of the closet, and all those things that you thought were only the shadows of your clothing looking scary turn out to be even scarier than you thought they were. Yeah. And uh... meanwhile, it's happening not just in, it's not just happening in, in Tunisia, and it's not just happening in Egypt. It's happening in Yemen, and it's happening in Jordan. And Jordan is one of the few really moderate Islamic countries out there. And the the people stoking the fires of this revolution, they're called Al Jazeera. And even though Al Jazeera English is the best foreign language television service I've seen in a long time, Al Jazeera in Arabic is not like that at all. And Al Jazeera, which has been stoking the fires of these revolutions, is presenting it in ways that you and I don't really get to hear about. All of these revolutions are being presented as an Islamic response to throw off the shackles of American-sponsored tyranny. So what in the world, if Al Jazeera has its way, is going to replace American-sponsored tyranny? Iranian-sponsored tyranny, perhaps? Maybe because Al Jazeera comes from Qatar, and Qatar has a very good relationship with the Iranians, and in fact has just worked out new deals with the Iranians for exchange in guess what field? Media. Because Iran, too, has two global television stations. One is Al Alam, which is a, an Arab-language television service, and the other is Press TV, which is global. 
and is in English. And guess who has been on both of those stations? You. Me, of <laughs> all people, as the monster, the enemy, the, the Zionist in the closet. Yes, the, the evil, evil Zionist boogeyman. Zionist, uh, uh, atheist, Jew, with blood dripping from his fangs. And next money time, uh, bags under his fingertips. Next, next time you go on there, be sure to actually, you know, buy some some uh, stage blood and put it around your. <laughs> no, I want to convince those those people, those few people who can be convinced in the audience of these television stations that the point of view that they're being exposed to is not the only available point of view. Um, I did want to. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about. Um, Something that's a kind of an interesting offshoot of the Egypt story, right? And um, that's you know basically uh, uh, today the Egyptian government basically shut down Egyptian internet in the, in the hopes to um, quell the uh, uh, rebellion, I guess. Yeah, and yesterday they shut and, down Facebook. Yeah, uh, there's pretty much been a total Egyptian internet shutdown now. I mean, you can't you can't uh, ping to any of their Egyptian servers. Um, and you know nothing. Not pretty much no news uh, is coming out of Egypt, at least not through the internet, uh, which you know in, in today's uh, world is pretty crippling. Um, but you know one of the things that's interesting to me is that um, there is a uh, a bill that uh, being sponsored by uh, Joe Lieberman called the Protecting Cyberspace as a National Asset Act or PCNAA, right. which uh, would basically uh give the president of this country the ability to uh to kill the internet if uh, if he deemed it uh to be necessary in in the event of a uh quote unquote cyber emergency so um oh my god i you know i, I what, don't what, i'm not what, i'm not very comfortable with that with that power what being dark closet has joe lieberman been spending too much time in i don't um, know <laughs> I, I think that should be accompanied by the cyber heads and hands act um, if uh, people look like they're messing with our cyberspace, we should immediately be able to cut off their heads and their hands. Um, this is crazy. Yeah, uh, it's it's um it's pretty insane, and it it was uh, something that was introduced in June of last year. Uh, did, yeah, didn't get a lot of traction then, but it's just been uh, reintroduced in January of this year. This is actually a story from the twenty fourth. That I'm getting this from. Right. So just a couple of days ago. Ancient, ancient history. Yes, three yes, days ago. Yes, three days. The distant yeah. past. The time right. of antiquity. Um, the, the Egyptians and the dinosaurs. <laughs> the ancient Egyptians yeah, and the dinosaurs. Yeah, the ancient. Pyramid building pyramid. Egyptians and the dinosaurs. Yeah. Around the same time too, if you believe the creation. Well, well, this leads this um, leads to the the, the, to the so, state uh, of the union. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's b before we get to the state of the union, though. Um, I mean, th this, this is something that s it seems to me like, I, I want to ask you a question uh, leading into the state of the union and it's kind of brought on by this, this internet thing. Um, the, isn't it kind of strange that we have probably one of the most privileged people in the country at any given time, the, the, the most powerful man possible, give us the state of the union address as if he really has any idea about the State of the Union, as if he's not kind of inculcated in this uh, this bubble of, of blissful ignorance. Well, you have a very, very good point. There he is isolated in the White House. He got to, uh, to power um, by being supported by the Kennedys. Um, he's been, uh, because he's, he's black and multiracial, he's been uh, championed through the corridors of Harvard, and he's been brought directly, ushered directly into the aristocracy of America, um, and he's been living in the aristocracy for a long time. But the irony, yes, uh, you're you're absolutely right. Isn't isn't it ironic that the people that I mean, look, Washington, isn't it ironic that the people who rule us are people who are radically disconnected from us in general? If uh, I, I told you. In our last exciting uh, video episode about the fact that I had gone down to Washington a month and a half ago um, because I was given the opportunity to, to sit in in a meeting of 40 people sitting around a conference table, and I was one of those sitting at the conference table, and 15 of the other people or 14 of the other people were the heads of research and development um, for the Department of Energy's uh, 14 research and development labs. Well, 
this is the first time that, that cruising through Washington, uh, on my way to this meeting, I realized Washington is like Oz. It is utterly disconnected from the United States of America. It has its own architecture, and it's glorious architecture. It's one of the most glorious cities architecturally I've ever seen in my life, more impressive to me than Paris. But that's the problem. It's impressive. Why is it impressive? Because so much money is focused in Washington. And that money is able to build structures of a kind of uh, architectural ebullience that simply doesn't exist in the rest of the United States. So once you get into Washington, you are in, you are no longer in the United States of America. You are in a city of some sort of aristocracy that floats above the rest of us because it is supported by so much money. I mean, I think I told you this figure, and uh, I have the figures only approximately right, but the magnitude of the differences um, are accurate. And that is that in 1800, which is a mere 210 years ago, not that long ago, um, in, but certainly by, by contrast with the time back to the Egyptian pyramids. Um, so a mere 210 years ago in 1800, guess how many people worked in the federal government of the United States? Nice. 115. It was 115. You could, you could bring all of them into a large ballroom and have them talk to each other and then have them go back to their offices. <laughs> and the, largest office, the, the largest office in the United States of America, one of them, was the patent office. Of course, in those days, what we think of as the office hadn't been invented yet. The, the central five cabinet, which changed the face of things, had not been invented. So I think I told you this story, and stop me if I'm boring you, but the fact is that one of the biggest offices in the United States was the patent office. After all, America had been in operation for about 14 years since the Declaration of Independence, and we were already filing uh, more patents than just about any other country on the planet per capita. Well, guess what? The office of the, the, uh, of the patent office looked like. Guess how many employees it had? Uh, seven. <laughs> it had one. <laughs> it had one. And do you know what this guy's job was? Okay, you, TJ, um, have just come up with a patent for God knows what, uh, electronic peanut butter or pre-electronic peanut butter. Okay. And you come to me, I'm in the patent office to file your patent. So you give me this piece of paper. Guess what I do with this piece of paper? There's no such thing as a Xerox machine. There's no such thing as a typewriter. There's certainly no such thing as a scanner. And I got to make a copy of your document. So well, how do I do it? I sit there and write down the whole document all over again on another piece of paper by hand with a quill pen, for God's sakes. <laughs> Fun job. How's this for? Yeah, how's this for modernism? I mean, at least we've invented paper and at least we've invented the pen. But that's about it. Um, so I take that piece of paper that I've copied and I roll it up in a little scroll and then I wrap it in a ribbon, a red ribbon. And guess what we call that ribbon? No, tape. I... <laughs> I wrap it up in a red tape. Of course, nobody's invented adhesive for this kind of tape yet. Nobody's invented the 3M, which invented scotch tape, but won't exist for another God knows how many years. So I, so I wrap it in a red ribbon, and guess how I file it? No well, idea. Approximately Go ahead. 20 years, <laughs> approximately 20 years before this. I never know when your questions are rhetorical. Something. Yeah, well, they're not rhetorical. But at any rate, I mean, I'm just quizzing you. But um, at any rate, so, so somebody about 20 years ago has invented this fancy new highfalutin information retrieval technology called the cubby hole, the pigeon hole. Do you know what a pigeon hole is? Yeah. It's a hole in the wall, or if when you really get fancy, somebody's gotten really super high tech and invented a desk that has a whole bunch of them, maybe 20, right? For all the patents in the United States. So most, some of the patents get filed in pigeon holes, and most of them get filed on the floor. The point of this is that by, uh, in 1875, I must have told you this story, in 1875 or 1876, a lot of hot new technologies come down the pike. One of them is the telephone, so that by staying in one place, you can contact a whole bunch of people. 
And another one of them is the typewriter, so we don't have to hand copy these things anymore. We can do it by typing them up. Um, and, and, but, but things don't really get fancy until 1895 when the real killer app is invented. And that killer app for information retrieval is the file cabinet. And once you have a central filing system, it makes sense to have 100 people in an office instead of one. And then you can, you can, you can hire 100 women, young women, nubile young women, um, to type things for you. Well, that's 200 people in an office. And everybody, when they get a new piece of information, can walk over to this really amazing new information storage and retrieval device, the central file cabinet, and can file the latest piece of paperwork that has come in. Astonishing. And then if you want to check on some of the paperwork, you can do it using the telephone. So it makes sense to have a whole bunch of people in an office. And the result is that by 1900, just 24 years after the invention of all these highfalutin new technologies and only five years after the invention of the central filing cabinet, it makes sense not to have people in homes, in their own homes doing their work. It makes sense to bring a bunch of them together into one office. So you know how many employees the uh, uh, United States government had by 1900? Probably more than 115. Yes, more than 115, something like 115,000. Okay, let's resort to the makeup department again, because I'm getting so hot and sweaty and excited about all of this stuff that I'm getting covered with God knows. But at any rate, um, strange liquids. Um, liquids come, that come pouring from the pores of human beings when they get excited. Okay, now, how many employees do you think we were up to 100 years later in the federal government? I, mean, I hate to sound like Ron Paul here because I'm certainly not on his side of things at all. Um, but good old Ron take Paul. One guess. Uh, yes, good old Ron Paul. Okay, I'll take a guess. Um, uh, uh, I have no idea. 300,000? Ah, you're getting close. 8.5 million. <laughs> okay, Does so I'm, I'm slightly, slightly of off, just a little shy. Right, uh, and when you've got a whole bunch of mega corporations and all of them want special tax breaks written into the law of the United States of America, they all maintain um, armies of lobbyists to influence the people, and not only well the elected officials, but also the unelected officials, those other 8.5 million people who are federal employees. And when, so money comes flooding into Washington, D.C. to influence the legislation that will, that will uh, rule your life and mine. And the result, hey, so much money in Washington that they could afford to build buildings of a kind that is staggering to the eye. Even in the days, even in days like the, the last three years, the last two years since the great crash of 1980 or 2008, um, when the rest of the country has been staggering and, and, and suffering. Washington has not been staggering and suffering. So I hate to sound like a Republican making a case for small government here because I don't agree with these bozos. I mean, you know, these are the people of the big lie. I mean, we talked about Adolf Hitler and the fact that, uh, for, uh, that violence is a force multiplier. Well, we are very lucky. We have change in this country, radical change sometimes in this country, without cutting off a single head or slicing off a single hand and without people dying in the streets. We have it through democratic means. But the, the fact is that the Republicans are using another technique that came from Adolf Hitler. It's called the big lie. We talked, I think, in our last exciting TV episode about the fact that the Republicans have said over and over again in talking about what they call monstrously Obamacare. I mean, they, 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 they bring up so many big lies in talking about what they call Obamacare, medical uh, uh, some sort of uh, God knows government sponsored program for making sure that all of us have access to medical care. Um, they, they have said on television over and over again, especially the, the master sleaze bucket. Um, um, what is his name? Uh, there, there's, there's, which Boehner one? Who there's makes, so many. Of okay. Them. There's, there's Boehner who makes me sick. But then there's little what's his name who says that the entire purpose of the American, um, 
government over the course of the next two years is to make sure that Obama is a one-term president. Is that here we have a major economic crisis on our hands, How about and this is what he thinks is the major purpose of the American government? Give me a break. What is his name? The, the one in is the... It, is it Mitch McConnell you're talking about? Or? Mitch McConnell, the one who looks like a turtle, who has the face of a turtle, for God's sakes. Look at those lips. Can you trust a man whose lips are first like this always, every single minute of the day? And who says that the whole purpose of the American government is to make sure that President Obama is a one term president. Meantime, these little assholes, if you look, I mean, we're, you know, we're on YouTube, so we can afford to use words like assholes. These little assholes are using the big lie to the nth degree. They went on television over and over again and told us over the course of the last few months, we have the best health care system in the world. I was actually just watching a video today from a, a conservative YouTuber explaining why the uh, American pharmaceutical industry is uh, the greatest thing to ever happen. So, Okay, now I am a huge fan of the American pharmaceutical industry because you know that I spent 15 years in a fucking bed as a yeah. prisoner of well, a bedroom. Well, uh, maybe I should give and... some context on that. Uh, the thing was... Okay. Um, <clears throat> Basically, uh, there was a YouTuber who posted a video about how a necessary life-saving medicine uh, skyrocketed in price from being $50 uh, a month to being $600 a month, uh, you know, not beyond his ability to afford, but perhaps beyond the ability of some people with a similar affliction. Like you and me. Yeah. Yes. So, um, you know, basically this conservative YouTuber then made the response, uh, you know, basically like, uh, you know, yeah, that's bad, but you're lucky to live in America where, you know, such medicines exist because of our wonderful free market system and, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, I, I happen to think that there there's probably a happy medium between those two positions. So. Well, there must be, because the American pharmaceutical industry is absolutely terrific and is pulling off miracles, but um, it is uh, equaled by the European pharmaceutical industry. I mean, Merck, um, well, I think Merck is, in, uh, is a New Jersey-based company, but most of the rest of them are, are, Swi are Swiss-owned. Um, and, um, and just European owned in general and quite in a, Europe, quite a guess what German kind of free too. market medical system they have? <clears throat> Any idea? Um, it's not, not particularly free market. No, they don't have a free market medical system. They have a socialized medical system and their pharmaceutical industry is every bit as inventive as ours. It, ours and, and theirs are the two biggest pharmaceutical systems in the world. And then running a close third is the Japanese. Um, I don't know what the Japanese healthcare system is like, but here's the deal: if we have the best system, uh, I know. I don't system, know. I don't know what their. Well, I don't know what their regulations are as per the pharmaceutical industry, but I know that they have uh, a more progressive health system than the United States does. It's not. It's not market based, at least not uh, to the same extent as ours is. So. Right, the Japanese system. So, well, here's the deal. If we have the best medical system in the world, as John Boehner says repeatedly, and as Mitch McConnell, I'm well, sure, has said at one time or another. One, one thing I want to say, though, one thing yeah. I want to say, though, is, uh, is they now say, at least Sarah Palin now says that we used to have the best, but now we don't because of Obamacare. So. Well, we used to have the best once upon a time a long, long time ago, but the, the quality of the American medical system has declined under uh, uh, Republicans like, um, uh, uh, oh God, what was his name? Ronald Reagan. How could I block on that name? Like, like Ronald Reagan and especially George Bush, but it really is nobody's fault. It Ronald, is not the fault of the Ronald Reagan who opposed Medicare, by the way. Yeah, well, but the fact is that 27 countries... Um, in 27 countries, people live longer than we do, and that was true before Obama was ever elected to the government. It was true under George Bush. Um, so they are lying when they say we have the best medical system in the world. We do not. We have a seriously flawed medical system, and we frankly do not know what the problem is. Plus, under George Bush, um, the uh, medical system went from uh, taking approximately 11% of our economy to taking approximately 17% of our economy. That is a big bite. 
um, the American automobile industry went to a position where it spent something like $2,400 on medical expenses and medical insurance for its employees for every automobile it built. That's one reason that Detroit could not compete, that Ford and Chrysler and General Motors could not compete with the Japanese because our medical system was costing $2,400 per car and the Japanese medical system was apparently better and more efficient because the Japanese live longer than we do and guess how much the Japanese spend on medical insurance per car? 400 frigging dollars. Yeah. $400 uh, compared to $2,400. Something well, um, seriously wrong with the Republican Bush <laughs> medical system. Well, uh, I could I could tell you at least part of the problem that I've seen firsthand is, uh, you know, when um, my uh, father had his heart attack and I was, uh, you know, waiting in the emergency room, there were a ton of people in there for things that, you know, probably in bygone eras, people would have gone and seen a, a general practitioner for, uh, but they were in the emergency room because, you know, that was the only way they knew they, they wouldn't be... Uh, immediately charged they could you know get away with uh skipping on the bill right so there is a serious so, systemic problem so uh, you, you know i mean and, and those costs are of course you know going to be passed on to taxpayers they're going to be they're going to manifest in in more expensive surgeries for people who you know have no choice um so i mean you know th th there's there's a big problem when people when when medical care is so expensive that no one you know, goes to the doctor unless it's an emergency. I mean, that's a bad thing. You know, people need to be able to, uh, I mean, preventative medicine is, is the most effective. You know, you, you have to be able to comfortably say, you know, I'm going to go to the doctor because I think I might be getting sick. In America, it's like, well, I'm almost dead. I guess I better drag myself to the emergency room. Right. Plus, there's, there's no free market for doctors. In other words, you can't go to an Amazon.com for doctors and see patient reviews of the doctor, and you can't see uh, official reviews of the doctor, and you can't see any ratings of how the doctor does in terms of mortality for his uh, socioeconomic group. I mean, you know, if a doctor is doing miracles for people who are, um, uh, who are disadvantaged uh, economically, uh, um, and his people don't live as long, his patients don't live as long as other doctors, but he's, he, he's bringing them up from an average mortality rate of, uh, or an average uh, lifespan of 59 years to an average lifespan of 67 years, he deserves credit. But there's got to be some way of rating doctors so that we have a level playing field. And so we can actually, if, do you know how hard it is to find a doctor? Googling doctors is not easy. Yeah, in my town, uh, there is a, a phone line you can call if you're looking for a doctor. And, um, Basically, if you call the phone line, all they tell all they tell you is that none of the doctors are accepting new patients at this time. Uh, because oh, terrific! That's there's, wonderful. There's uh, there's not enough doctors for the amount of people that live here. So so we have a, a systemic problem, a, a deeply systemic problem. But no, 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 sort. no, no, no. The, the American system. We have the best system in the world. Don't worry. We have it's, the, it's the best, best system in the world, and it's a and instead of costing us twenty four hundred dollars per car under George Bush, if we continued the rate of increase under George Bush, um, within another eight years, it would have been costing us forty five hundred dollars per car or thirty five hundred dollars per car. It the the Bush medical system was bushwhacked. It was not working. It was not sustainable. And if uh, we were to continue with that, which is what the Republicans want, I mean, look, the Republicans are the party who broke the bank. The Republicans are the party who gave us the biggest deficit in the history of the world. They ran up that deficit fighting the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. Now, whether those wars were necessary or unnecessary is another subject for another time. But they did it. One of the biggest socialist programs you can do you can you, you can implement is called a war it is hideously expensive we were told by george bush that the war in vietnam or the war in uh, iraq would never cost us more than 50 million dollars a year now i got news for you 50 million dollars a year or 50 billion dollars a year sorry 50 billion dollars a year is a huge humongous honking wonking hunk of money did that turn out to be accurate? 
No, the war costs us more like 250 to 500 billion dollars a year, a quarter of a trillion dollars a year. We ran up an immense deficit under George Bush. And guess who brought us the Great Recession of 2008? Guess who was president under the Great Recession of 2008? George fucking mucking Bush. <laughs> and how quickly we forget. And guess um, who brought us the bailout? Guess who brought us the bailout that little Mitch McConnell with his mean little lips is telling us is Obama's fault and the Democrats and the taxing and spending party? I'm sorry. The party that taxes and or the party that doesn't tax but spends its ass off and runs us into the ground, it's called the Republican Party. Yeah. It's as simple as that. And the party of bailouts, the party that invented the bailout, the Republican Party. Now, I think that bailout was wise because it kept us from an even greater economic collapse. And it's important to look at the policies of both parties and to be nonpartisan and to try to judge them for their actual value. This is very difficult because we all have allegiances to a party. And this brings us back to the Egyptians. The best way to organize a social group to accomplish anything is to identify an enemy. The Republicans have been remarkably successful at identifying an enemy, a demon in the woodwork. The demon in the woodwork is called the Democratic Party, the party of tax and spend. The problem is the people who do all the spending are the fucking Republicans who brought us the national debt. Yeah, I mean, if you look at pretty much any... Uh... I mean, I've seen a, a number of graphs from a number of different sources that just compare, you know, the last, you know, 10 or so presidents in terms of, uh, you know, the deficits they ran up. And it seems like Republicans pretty consistently run up way larger deficits than Republican uh, than, than Democrats. It's so. the party, it's uh, you know, the it, party it, of spend and don't tax. It's the party of spend. It's the party of spend and spend don't tax and lie. And lie about spending. It's the party of spend and lie. It's the party of the big lie and the big debt. It's as simple as that. It's also the party of the big crash. The yeah. two biggest crashes in the last hundred years have been the, the, the crash of 1929 to 1932, and the crash of 2008. And guess what party was in charge when the crash of 1929 took place? Republicans. The Republicans, yes. Um, and guess what party was in charge when the crash of 2008 took place? I don't have to guess. I remember. <laughs> it was only a couple of years ago. So the, so the Republicans are the party of economic catastrophe. I 100% agree with you. Uh, but let's, let's, uh, we, we kind of veered way off topic. We were going to talk about the state of the union at well, one point. Wait, and then so, it so, never, so the state of the union, the point is, there is a point here. And there, that is, even I organize my thoughts best in response to an enemy. And that enemy for me is the Republicans because I'm a Democrat. But it is extremely important to step out of yourself to know that you organize best in the competition of one group against another group. Um, to recognize that you galvanize people best in the competition of one group versus another group. But it's also important to realize that you are a political animal, that you are motivated by demonizing other people, and to step outside of your role as a political animal and look to see when a bastard like Mitch McConnell or a monster, I mean, actually, John Boehner, well, they're both, I don't know, to my mind, they're both monsters and demons. So, but it's important to recognize when the monster or the demon is saying something of value. Yeah. And, uh, hold and on, hold Obama on one second. did I'm, I'm that. Gonna have to, I, have okay. to, I have to excuse myself for one moment here. I'll be right okay. back. Okay. All right. Uh, in all probability, ladies and gentlemen, because we want to uh, make sure that we are as slick here as any other broadcasting operation, as slick here as Jay Leno and The Tonight Show, uh, we are bringing you a live episode in which our host is probably going to the bathroom. Has that ever been confessed? <laughs> Does John Stewart... Um, or, uh, oh, God, what is his name? The guy who comes on uh, just before Jon Stewart, the what's call it report. 
Um, I mean, do, and do these guys ever confess that they've forgotten what in the world they're talking about or who in the world they're talking about? Um, and that one of them's going to the bathroom. Now, having entertained you with this episode, I believe that TJ is back. Yes. Um, yes, TJ, you'll have to see what, what I've been saying in your absence. Yeah. I've, I've been explaining all the backstage strange things like urinating um, that happen um, during a real TV performance. Oh, that's pretty cool. Remember, this is YouTube. Only we bring you the truth. <laughs> the truth. Our version of the yeah. truth. It's a. Uh... All right, but back to okay. Back okay, to the state. State of the union. State of the union. Um, can, okay. can I? No, no, wait, let me. Uh, just... you, you you tend to be more uh, a little bit more long winded than me, so I'm gonna. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me let me just connect a couple of things here. Okay, okay. okay. Go ahead. First of all, Obama stepped out of his partisanship because we're all partisan. I'm partisan. TJ is partisan. Um, Lies! And, and, God, and God knows Osama bin Laden is partisan, not to mention Mitch McConnell. I've always he thought of, out of, his part of, of Osama as kind of a moderate, you know, so. He seems oh, like a he's, moderate. Well, he's, he's, he, he's yeah. willing to cross party lines. And, yes, that's true. Um, uh, so at any rate, now, the point is that Obama stepped out of his partisan role and he adopted an idea from the opposition when it came to medical care. And he said, we have to do something about the outrageous amounts of money that doctors have to pay in liability insurance because of malpractice suits. Well, that is a point the other, that the, the other side has been making. It was valid, and he deserves credit for stepping out and accepting the other point, part of view, point of view for a second and a half, something Mitch McConnell has sworn he will never in his lifetime do. Now, what does it have to do with the Egyptians and the Tunisians in the streets? They are organizing themselves based on their perception of an enemy. And um, Al, Al Jazeera is trying to tell them that the enemy is America. And what they are doing is freeing themselves from American-sponsored dictatorships, which to a certain extent, unfortunately, is true. Um, and uh, Osama is trying to tell them that they are organizing themselves against anybody who doesn't recognize that the only truth in the world is the kind of Islam that lops off heads, lops off hands, and blows up people in the streets on a daily basis. And every faction is trying to organize these Islamic people in the streets around an enemy. And of course, the enemy of choice is me. Why? Because I'm a Zionist, I'm a Jew, and I'm an atheist. Yes. And Zionists, atheists, and Jews are the ultimate enemy. But So the real trick here is to, yes, organize around competition. And this is what Obama was trying to do in the State of the Union speech. He said, there is, we are having a Sputnik movement moment. What did he mean? We have a competitor. Um, and that competitor is, God knows what it is, but we have to operate as if we were competing. Just as we did in the days of the Cold War, which we said in previous episodes, was actually one of the longest pieces in the history of the world. Fifty years of peace. Small wars, not big wars. So the, the concept of organizing against an enemy is a necessity in the human emotional system. The trick is to organize the way we organize sports teams, to the way the Yankees compete against God knows who they compete against these days. I have no idea who sports teams are. Uh, the Angels. Um, <laughs> so why don't you just stay away from the sports analogies? Yes. Yeah. But, but the point is that in sports, it works. In sports, you can get your emotions out there to the nth degree in a competitive frenzy without killing anybody. And that's the real trick to get ourselves into a competitive frenzy so we get back into the ring and compete our asses off and continue to lead the world because I want us to lead the world, for God's sakes. I don't want the Chinese with the fact, with, with, with uh, jailing somebody who disagrees with them to lead the world. Okay, that's the end of that speech. Well, uh, that actually kind of um, actually kind of brings up something else that, uh, that I, I, I want to talk about. Um, I actually forgot until you were just talking about that because, you know, you're talking about, you know, um, the reason that America is successful is that at least usually we're able to solve these sort of disputes without violence. I mean, there, it's not 100% accurate. I mean, there have been little flare-ups here and there, but um, nothing, you know, comparable to something like what's happening in Egypt or right. uh, Tunisia or you know, most of the, what's happened when there's 
this sort of disagreement throughout human history. Um, Timothy McVeigh was the most violent we've gotten, and he was a real exception to the rule. Yeah, yeah. And um, but what I wanted to talk about was um, I, I know you're, you're you're certainly very aware that uh, the right wing uh, party in America, the Republican Party, has come under fire in the wake of um, the um, the Arizona the shooting, shooting in Arizona, yeah, right. uh, you know, for Gabriel Giffords, right, for the use of uh, a lot of violent rhetoric, and um, you know, I, I don't, I don't know how much I put stock into the idea that the violent rhetoric was in any way a direct effect on uh, what happened, but I mean, it certainly made us stop and examine that for a minute, and it does. But you know, I mean, even before that, a lot of people on the left, a lot of progressives kind of looking around and, and, you know, being very discomfortable, uncomfortable with the kind of uh, rhetoric they, they kept hearing coming out of the right wing. You know, it, it's a lot of, a lot of gun metaphors, a lot of talk about, you know, uh, second amendment remedies and, you know, maybe a revolution is necessary. And I mean, just the other day, a Republican uh, by the name of Eric Erickson, who uh, is actually the CNN commentator, uh, editor in chief of uh, a blog called redstate.com said that uh, you know if if um, uh, that maybe violent blood maybe a bloodshed would be necessary if um, if we couldn't get Roe v Wade overturned so they're still oh my god yeah uh. still using the violent rhetoric and you know it, it it I mean like you know you can find leftists who use this kind of language but you can't really find them in mainstream political positions. I mean, you know, Michael Moore is never going to be like, we need to chop off Glenn Beck's head, you know, but Glenn Beck has right. talked about killing Michael Moore and how much he would enjoy it. So, I mean, there's there's a, a big discrepancy. I, I don't know. Do you think that there maybe uh, is, a, is a risk there of them talking about violence so much that they actually work themselves up into a frenzy and, and yeah i it. think uh in, in new you know the old bloomism is new ways of seeing lead to new ways of being perceptions lead to actions right um and uh there is a lot of talk about the fact that uh, obama was not born in the united states he is really a closet marxist he is uh in the white house for a very specific purpose he's here to take over the american government on behalf of a marxist socialist state that's part of a one world plot um to take over to, to you know snuff out american freedoms totally and uh that uh, obama the the uh indication and the words are that Obama is a traitor, um, that he is a foreign agent. Um, and when you start using terminology like this, yes, you, you get people more and more riled up until violence seems to be the only rational thing to do. And you have to be aware of that kind of thing. And we have to be aware of it on our side. I mean, remember, once upon a time, our side and the progressives and the parents of today's progressives and the grandparents of today's, today's progressives were Marxists. Once upon a time, they were many of them were Stalinists. Once upon a time, they really were in favor of a violent revolution in the United States. So we have to watch out for violent rhetoric on both sides. And one of the things that bothered me, TJ, is that when the shooting took place, first of all, I watched the video that was made by the shooter, and it was not, uh, he was not inspired by right-wing rhetoric, and he was not inspired by left-wing rhetoric. If anything, if he was inspired by anybody, it was by the post-structuralists. It was by people like French philosophers, like Baudrillard, who said you could be controlled through your language, you could be controlled through the way people set up paragraph structure. But remember, this guy was not on planet Earth. This guy was in a serious delusional state. And I don't know if you've ever been with people who are in a delusional state. I've been with them three times. It is unlike anything you've ever seen in your life. These people are not on planet Earth. You, they, they think they can walk off the roof of a building, and they won't fall. They'll just go in a straight line. Why? Because God's hands will be under them. Um, because they have a magical power. They think they can step out onto an eight-lane freeway where the cars are doing 70 miles an hour and every car will stop and that they have telepathic contact with every single driver. Now, it would only take a few seconds out on that freeway for them to learn that they're not quite correct. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, they won't survive the learning experience. Um, so you have to take people like this and get them out of the way as rapidly as possible because they could either be dangerous to themselves or dangerous to other people, as the shooter turned out to be. So neither the left 
nor the right had anything to do with the shooting. But you are well, right. Well, you know, and let, let's just say, you know, even if we go with uh, the, you know, he's just crazy, he's in a delusional state. I mean, doesn't some of the blame then have to fall on Ronald Reagan for defunding mental health programs in America and basically setting the lunatics free out of the asylums. I mean, and they were originally, um, uh, the, the, the movement to begin the expulsion of, uh, those who were insane from lunatic asylums began under us leftists in the 1960s when we watched, uh, read books and watched movies like one flew over the cuckoo's nest and came to the crazy conclusion that crazy people are really saner than you and I. And that was a big mistake. Well, that, uh, that's been around for a long time. I mean, that's how Rasputin uh, <laughs> came to power, because they thought, you know, uh, because he's talking all this gibberish, he must have uh, contact with the divine. Well, now there, but there is a way in which the right was responsible for this, because a, a lunatic walks into a store and is able to buy a gun that can unload, how many shots was it, TJ? 36? And a clip? Uh, yeah, something like that. Okay, now this is crazy. This is insane. Um, the right, the NRA, has been gaining more and more and more power uh, for a long, long time. My interpretation of the Second Amendment is that every state has a right to maintain a militia by having men who are militia members under the control of the state who have arms within their own homes. It is, in, that, in my interpretation, so far as I can tell, the Second Amendment does not say every lunatic has a right to a gun. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the NRA says that every lunatic has a right to a gun. Well, I mean, and, I, I, don't, I don't know about interpretations of the Second Amendment, but I, I do know that I generally... I generally just don't think prohibition works that well. Uh, you know, I mean outlawing drugs has not gotten rid of drugs at the brief period of time that we outlawed alcohol certainly to get rid of didn't get rid of alcohol uh you know i, I don't i don't i just you know i i would be in favor of maybe some gun control if i thought it would be the least bit effective but i really just think it would create a big black market and just make things a little bit uglier so well that could be um i think that a light amount of control might help in other words we have we've but you know, I, I, I don't know if you saw this but even dick cheney uh came out saying that maybe he, he said maybe it, you know that um, a measure to uh to uh, get rid of um those uh extended clips might be something we should look into uh, you know so this is dick cheney saying this i mean this is right. a guy who literally shot someone who, who shot, them, office. Yeah, shot mean, some uh, friend of his in the face you know um and well but at i'm look i come from an urban culture i come from a jewish culture jews don't tend to get involved with guns at all and in urban culture people don't have guns and in the country people grow up with guns and it's a natural part of life and it's like having a hammer in your tool chest which you could also kill people with to have a gun so it's not fair for people from my culture to be dictating what people from another subculture within the same society should be doing or at least without considering the fact that we do come from different subcultures and we can't just impose our own subcultural values on everybody but still it would be useful if when you wanted to buy a gun you had to wait two weeks and, the, and they had to do a, a little bit more checking on you um, um i i do have another question uh I yeah. want to ask. it's kind of in the same vein um my my main problem with the right wing's interpretation of the Second Amendment uh, is that it says right to bear arms. It doesn't necessarily say right to have guns, you know. And in modern times, arms, uh, you know, that could include you know uh, uh, ballistic missiles and and you know flamethrowers and all sorts of you know nasty new things that we've come up with since. Uh, since the Constitution was ratified. So, right. uh, you know, it, even if their interpretation is correct, I mean, the Founding Fathers couldn't have predicted all this. And, you know, I mean, you, you have to draw a line somewhere. I mean, you don't want civilians able to to own, you know, uh, chemical weapons and, you know, uh, things of that nature. So, um, right. I mean, obviously, well, no I... matter what your, your stance is, you have to draw the line somewhere. Uh, you don't want people enriching plutonium in their garage, for fuck's sake. Right. Well, I, that, that's true. And, and, you know, the general call after the uh, shooting of Gabriel Giffords um, was for a higher level of civility. And um, that is an absolute necessity in a democratic country. 
um, and it's a necessity on the left and it's a necessity on the right and this kill at all costs, um, take no prisoners attitude of Mitch McConnell. Well, Mitch McConnell, frankly, is not Glenn Beck. Um, Mitch McConnell is, is not a radio show host going out there talking about using violent solutions. Um, he's simply talking about freezing the government and, well, well, he doesn't believe the government can do anything anyway of positive value. So freezing the government to him is no loss whatsoever. But the point is a greater mod uh, level of moderation and civility um, would be wise on both sides. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, I think it'd be... Um... Oh, I don't know. I'm kind of conflicted on, on the whole civility thing because it's it's so much more fun to be uh, to be a cantankerous loudmouth and and uh, and demonize the other side. It's 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 a lot less fun to uh, to view them as uh, human beings like yourself who just happen to have oh, an opposing well, viewpoint. Well, uh, the raucous competition. Um, I don't know much about sports, but once upon a time I went to a hockey game. Uh, I got caught up in the spirit of the thing, and the spirit of the thing was a competition that got you so thrilled and involved that every muscle in your body was involved with the next move and whether you'd make that puck go someplace or not. Um, and and it was thrilling, absolutely thrilling. And that level of competition and that level of thrill is an absolute necessity to get this country off its ass and win the future, because the president was absolutely right. We have to win the future, period. And we have to get motivated to do it. Um, so using these us versus them motivations and this let's demonize them motivation to move us forward, to give us, uh, to, to put us on the fast track, to make us pave the fast track for the future, that's a necessity. But there has to be somehow a balance between the sports-like competition that thrills every, every muscle in your body and in which rhetoric is definitely involved and calling the other side traitorous and saying that they have to be exterminated um, in order to save the freedoms of the United States. Yeah, definitely a big difference there. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, oh, God, I just forgot what I wanted to ask. Um, no, I remember now. Um, what, what are, you know, I, I liked the State of the Union all right. I thought it was pretty good. I mean, it was a little bit vague, but you kind of expect that out of a State of the Union. Um, what are some things that you would have liked to see in that speech that you didn't see? Because I know there was a well, few the things only... that, uh, that I wanted to say that I didn't Okay, the, the things that I thought were really good is you know that I think that America has been suffering from a serious case of vision deprivation. Um, I, uh, we've talked about the fact that a nation that looks up goes up and a nation that looks down goes down. And we've been tunneling into the ground for so long it's ridiculous. And um, this speech gave us a sense of a future. This gave us a sense of looking up. This, sense, this speech gave us a sense of uh, the guy in... Uh, who, who started the drilling company that had uh, new high technologies for drilling and was able to help save the um, miners in Chile and who said that I may be a small company, but I can do big things. Um, he brought us back to the, to the can-do spirit to a certain extent, and that was an absolute necessity, but he didn't lift our eyes to the ultimate frontier, and the ultimate frontier is space. There's more real estate in space than there is on planet Earth. Um, there's enough real estate in space nearby to make nine, ten, nine hundred planet Earths, and, and life deserves the future up there, and, and the, the, the humans are inspired by looking up. So I would have liked to see that vast new frontier and that new economic frontier and that new frontier that's going to make the jobs. It's not going to make the jobs of the next two years. It's not going to save people from home foreclosures over the course of the next 18 months, but it's going to provide the jobs of the next of your kids generation and their kids generation. And we want the generation of our kids and our grandkids to still be ahead of the rest of the world, to still be delivering new potential new possibilities, new powers to humankind, because that's what keeps you on top of the world. So that's what I would have liked to see. But I like winning the future, and I like the idea of removing things. Mean, he did say so many concrete things that it was absolutely ridiculous, and one of them was that business of um, – wiping away or decreasing the amount of liability insurance that your doctor has to pay so that medical, the medical system does not cost us so much money, um, that the sand in the gears doesn't wipe out the efficacy of the system. I, I thought it was a really, really, really good speech. And innovation, he's absolutely right. Innovation is the future. Education, education is a necessary part of the future. It's not the whole future. Uh, I would have liked to see more about taking off. The, we talked about the fact that when I was down in Washington at this um, Department of uh, Energy um, session, 
with the 14 heads of the uh, research and development departments. They all talked, they all mentioned in passing the fact that there were on the shelf technologies of all kinds that nobody is using. And it's not just a matter of research and development. If you don't take the research and development and turn it into products that people will lust after, um, then you're not going to have the products that people lust after. Um, we probably talked about this too. Steve Jobs by, is paving the path for the future by using 50-year-old technologies. Steve Jobs is using the technologies developed at Xerox Park in the 1960s and 1970s. And for the last 40 years, Steve Jobs has been taking those technologies and turning them into the technologies of the future. He has not been researching and developing new things. He has been finding the new uses of old things, old things that have never been revealed to the public before. If it were, and we need somebody who will do what Steve Jobs has done for Xerox Park that developed all of these technologies he's using for the kinds of on-the-shelf technologies that are laying around all the research and development establishments all over the United States, from the Department of Energy to God knows what, the Department of Defense. Um, because that's what's going to provide the jobs of the next 30 years. Research and development is going to provide the jobs of the next 40 years, 50 years, and 60 years. Uh, so we have to not just have the long-term view, the view of the basic scientists, the people like me who are the dreamers thinking up new, new concepts, trying to think up radical new concepts. We also need the uh, schemes of the schemers, the engineers, the people who've got practical ideas for how to take uh, new concepts and turn them into radically new goods. Those are the only things I see as missing, but the view of looking up, the view of looking toward the future, the view of winning the future, the view of being competitive, and many of the concrete things that he said, because he said more concrete things than I've ever heard in a State of the Union address, although I must confess, TJ, this is the first State of the Union address I've ever watched all the way through, <laughs> primarily because I was prepping for our audience, because I thought they deserved to hear something about the State of the Union address. Um, he said so many concrete things it was ridiculous, and people, when people say that it was uh, uh, heavy on concept but light on substance, they don't know what they're talking about. Simply make a list of the substantial things he said, and you'll find at least ten major substantive things. One thing, uh, there's two things I'd like to comment on uh, briefly. Actually, there's three. Um, first, well, one of them you already beat me to the punch. I would have liked to hear more about space, too, but I knew I wasn't going to because for some reason... I think that there is a perception that if a president gets up there and talks about space, they're going to, uh, you know, be, be kind of mocked. Like, yeah, we already did that space shit back in the 60s. You know, that that's all right. That's all well and done. I remember even even one of the few things I liked, George W. Bush said, you know, we want to go to Mars. And then the media was like, ah, fuck you. We got problems here right. on Earth. We ain't going to Mars. Right. You know, uh, I was like, no, well, let's go to Mars. Down. No, he had, the... he said something good. Let's go, right. let's go to Mars. No, listen to Bush. Listen to Bush. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, no, the one thing I agree with him on. Um, but uh, the other thing I want to talk about, and I'm, I'm surprised you didn't mention it, because I know you, you, you really, really, really want to, uh, America to be more competitive with China, was uh, he did talk about uh, – about China and a few of the ways that they've kind of creeped ahead of us lately. And, you know, we better, you know, it's our Sputnik moment. We better, you know, uh, we better start innovating, better start trying to go after those Chinese and, uh, and try to, you know, beat them in the new global economy. Uh, I was pretty happy with that. But, uh, one thing that he mentioned that, you know, has kind of a, a, a dark flip side was he talked about the, um, the peop he talked about, you know, how America has some of the best universities and so many people come here to get their education. Ah, uh, yes, uh, he talked about not letting all those brains go to waste and go back to their own country. Yeah, you know, the, the, that's a huge problem. problem. We got, you know, I, I think I read somewhere something like 70% of people who get their, you know, these, these really, I don't remember what specific degree it was, but they're getting these really, you know, they're, they're coming uh, to America. To, I, okay, I remember what the statistic was. 70% of the people who come here from foreign countries to get their degrees go back to their foreign countries and start innovating over there, not over here. Exactly. You know, you gotta and they want to stay here, and they're not able to get visas. Keep them here. You know, if someone has a, a, a high-level degree in something like engineering or something, <laughs> keep them in the United States, please. Don't let them go well, back. As long, ago, as long ago as 10 years ago, America only had, and this is pathetic, um, 360 PhD graduates um, each year in advanced mathematics. 
an advanced mathematics, even though I don't understand it that well, um, uh, is, is extremely important to research and development, to innovation. Um, and guess what percentage of that 360 was American born? Forty percent, sixty percent was foreign born, and we won't give these people visas. Yes. How many people do they leave us with per year that are American born in advanced mathematics? One hundred and fifty. Is that enough to run a country? Uh, probably not. Don't to, <laughs> yeah, don't we want to keep these other people who are better at it than we are? And the thing that another thing that um, Obama didn't mention is the Chinese have a work ethic that makes ours look pathetic. We are one of the hardest working countries. We are the hardest working country in the West. We outwork the Europeans. But the fact is, the Chinese are willing to work a school kid in China. will start school at something like 7 in the morning and finish at midnight. How he gets any sleep, God alone knows. And he always has the sense that he's not doing well enough because of the expectations his parents have for him are extraordinarily high. What do we do in the United States? Did I ever tell you about my time at the Graduate School of Education doing research when I was a kid, when I was uh, 19 years old and 20 years old, the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Rutgers is one of the best universities in the country. And there I was, I hadn't even gone to my freshman year of college yet. For some reason, the, the guy who ran the uh, Graduate uh, School of Education, Rutgers University, let me into Rutgers University to do research of all things. And I discovered how the American education system was being gutted from the inside. It was being gutted, gutted by the guys who were running the education department who were being extraordinarily nice to me. Extraordinarily nice to me, but vicious to the American educational system in, because they were idealists, because they wanted to save American kids. They knew that one thing was more important to the psyche of a child than anything else is self-image. And they felt the entire educational system we should drop this whole notion of giving kids facts. They literally felt we should drop the whole notion of giving kids facts. They didn't need them. Yeah. They didn't need them. What did they need? A positive self-image. Well, these people from the 1960s, because this was 1963 and 1964, were very successful in their quest. And they turned the American educational system to a certain extent into a therapeutic system instead of an, er an educational system. And the result was that by... Um, the 1990s, um, the leading cross-cultural journal revealed something terrible. It revealed the fact that American kids had a very, very high self-image, even when they were doing extremely poorly. Meanwhile, Korean and Chinese kids had a very low self-image, and Japanese kids. Do you know why they had a very low self-image? Um, because they're pretty much told constantly that they're not doing well enough. <laughs> you know, they're yeah, pressured to be number one, is, number one, you must be the best. And, and, and the result is that when they're doing what we consider a level work in the United States, they think they're doing C level work. So they work harder and harder and do a plus and a plus plus and a plus plus level. Well, guess who's going to win in the international competition, which is constantly occurring, um, of the next 20 and 30 years, not to mention the next two years, not to mention the past 10 years. The kids who think they're not doing well enough, who've grown up to be adults and are still striving to get higher and higher, no matter how high they go, uh, they go. And those who pat themselves on the back and when they do a mediocre job, think that they've done wonderfully, they're not going to succeed. I mean, how would a hockey team do if its players felt that they were doing wonderfully, even if they hadn't learned to skate? <laughs> <laughs> Like on the ice. I, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of some of your analogies. I think that's probably one of the, one of your better ones. Um, I, I, that was actually that was actually mentioned on real time with uh, with Bill Maher the other night, um, last Friday. Not like last Friday. They, Bill Maher was lamenting the fact that we have uh, these kids that have tremendously high self esteem, and then uh, you know not they don't have anything to back it up. They're very pleased with themselves for no particular reason. Um, right. You know, I, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I would advocate us switching to the uh, the Asian uh, parenting slash school model of constantly demanding perfection, but uh, I do think we could we could probably do a little bit better than what we're doing now. I, I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm just I'm just remembering my own school days, and uh, you know, I'm sure we're we're polar opposites in terms of how we interacted with our school environments cuz uh I didn't do so well but um 
Oh, well, wait, let me tell you something. Here I am advocating, giving our kids a serious push, um, demanding of them excellence, really demanding outstanding performance of them, demanding that they get better and better and better at whatever they do. And yet, in a funny way, I was worse than you were in school because I never paid attention once. Once I got at the hang of it, look, I, I had a terrible time. When I, when I was in first grade, I was incredibly incompetent at doing the simple paperwork you're supposed to do on your desk. You know, sim fill out these simple things and then hand them up to the teacher and she gives a star to the first kid who finishes. And I was always the very, very last kid who finished anything. Yeah. And the one day, I probably told you the story, the one day that I wasn't absolutely last so far behind everybody else, they all had to wait for me. Um, I was second last. Instead of giving the gold star to the kid who came in first, which was the standard procedure, the teacher gave me the gold star for coming in second last instead of last. So I was horrible in school. And then, and I didn't learn to read and write until I was in second and third grade. But once I got the hang of reading in the year between my third grade and fourth grade and the summer between third grade and fourth grade, I got obsessed. These books were incredible. They were absolutely fascinating, these things called books. And once I got the hang of it, I started reading first one book a day and then two books a day. Well, guess how much time that gave me to pay attention to the teacher? Because uh, the only way to read two books a day was to read under the desk from the time you got into school in the morning until the time you left at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. So guess how much attention I paid to teachers? Zero. None. Absolutely. That's yes, uh, I, I, I was I was wrong. Our our childhoods were pretty much exactly alike, except yeah, so I wasn't I, I, I wasn't reading as much. I was I was I was writing more bad poetry and reading not quite as much. But you know, other than that, very similar. <laughs> right. So there is a case to be made here for self education. There is a case to be made here for what in science is called curiosity driven education. In science is called curiosity driven research. Curiosity has that power of passion that we were talking about. We we're talking about how sports teams competing build up a level of passion that gets into every cell of your muscles and that we need that when we're competing economically and we need that when we're creating competitively or when we're creating when we're when we are competing creatively. Um, when we are competing to give people new goods and services that do things for their lives that make them absolutely cream. That's what we want to do, give people a techno-orgasm with the quality of the services and goods and software and Facebooks and Googles that we are able to deliver next. And we do that when we have an extraordinary level of excitement. You and I followed our passions. We followed what we were excited about. Following your passions gives you gets you really vigorously involved with ideas and allows you to educate your fucking self. And I don't see a case being made for that anywhere in this country, and I don't know how to make the case. Yeah, I mean, but one way or the my, other, my main problem, I guess when it, when it boils right down to it, my main problem with the Asian education model isn't the amount of pressure it puts on kids. It's the very boring regimentation of the knowledge that they're supposed to. It just seems like it's you know, rote memorization, you know, please, you know, excel in this, excel in that, excel in this. I mean, I wouldn't care as much about high pressure being applied if it was like, whatever you're going to do, be the best at that. You know, that, okay, that, well, that, I think there's, a, I think you've, you've got your hands on an exceptional point here. And the exceptional point is that the American alternative, or at least the one that you and I were raised or allowed to raise ourselves with, because we weren't raised with it, our parents tore their hair out about what we were doing. <laughs> yes. But the American alternative is, if you follow your passions, you will get involved in working 16 hours a day, seven days a week, because you fucking love it, and your parents can't tear you away from it. They absolutely cannot tear you away from it. And that is the kind of excellence and achievement that we need in America. Following your own path with such a passion that you want to do it every waking minute of the day. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's something that's instilled in in, uh, in anyone. It really the, the only way it ever emerges is uh, if you know you just happen to have that right spark in your life at some point where it's like, wow, the the world has opened up for me. We don't really in, in, you know foster that or try to uh, encourage it. It just you know it has to happen. And uh, I think right, and that's happy. where a bizarre role model. Like my role model, Albert Einstein, comes into it because he had to teach himself too. 
He was terrible in school. He was not good at physics. He was not good at mathematics. He taught himself the physics and mathematics that he knew. And then he pursued it in his own way. Um, and because he was utterly, utterly fascinated with what he was doing and was utterly, utterly and completely following his fascinations, first of all, he couldn't get a job. He couldn't get a job as a physicist. He couldn't get a job as a mathematician. That's why he ended up with a job in the Patent Bureau. But he worked all his waking hours on what really fascinated him, putting ideas together in his own peculiar way. He worked as hard as the Chinese work. He worked from 6 o'clock in the morning until 12 o'clock at night because he fucking loved it. And that's what he wanted to do more than anything else in life. And that is, even though he wasn't an American, that's the American alternative to the Chinese role model of excellence. That's the one where you engage every cell in your brain and every cell in your body to pursue what the hell you find intensely, amazingly, astonishingly interesting. Yeah, I agree 100% with that. Uh, that's uh, that's pretty much uh, how, I, how I've lived my life. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't even, I didn't even realize probably until a couple of months ago how hard I actually work on things because I, it's never felt like work to me. I've always just been like, you know, uh, pursuing my own agenda with such fervor that. You know, I, I just think of it as like, this is another day, but, you know, I mean, every once in a while I'll, ha I'll have my lazy days where it's just like, I'm just going to fucking sit on the couch and watch TV all day and give my mind some fucking R&R, &R, but, uh, but those days are, are uh, pretty few and far in between. Well, we need a few more freeform Olympics that are sort of a cross between the ILT Intel uh, championships and the uh, and the Olympics themselves, where people who are uh, what would you call them? I mean, polymaths or self-taught people, people who are pursuing their own passions and who are not doing it in in a conventional way. You know, they're not doing standard skiing or standard shooting or standard uh, pole vaulting or anything like that. They're inventing their own ways through life um, that they that they can compete for some sort of prizes because that freeform competition. Um, that inventing whole new ways of doing things, that following your passions to the nth degree, that is really what makes what can give America the ultimate competitive advantage. I don't know if you uh, if you approach problems the same way I do, but when I look at any kind of situation, I find that I have to you know learn as much as I can about it and then forget as much as I can about it and kind of start back from scratch and build it in my own image. I don't know if. Uh, if that's similar to the way you do, I things. think we're all like that. But that's my. No, I think we all do that in one way. Because what, ha well, what happens to us? One of the things that happens to us is that we chew on something mightily as it comes out of the mouths of others, and at first it doesn't make sense to us, and we rebel against it, and we we think we're rejecting it, um, and we 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 stomp all over it with our feet, and we shit all over it in one way or another, and over the course of the next six months, we end up absorbing it, and by the time it by the time it really gets into our system, we don't remember where it came from. And we think it's our own idea. But it's often ideas or an amalgam of ideas that we picked up from others and that we've tossed aside because we felt they're in some way inferior. Um, so does that sound at all like what you're talking about? Yeah, to some extent. I, mean, I can think of a few different examples of, uh, of me coming around to a, a viewpoint similar to something I'd rejected months prior. Um, and, and then, you know, sort of... Uh, it, it, you know, it's interesting, you know, the, the way we can, you know, pull little strings out of the tapestry of the zeitgeist and sew our own little, you know, thing and, and, and think it's like, this is uniquely mine and I came up with this. I mean, it's well, good, that's what it's good us, that we do that because, you know, I mean, that's a big, at least for me, it's a big adrenaline rush to be like, oh, I came up with this. This is this is my idea. You know, you well, you know, one of the basic ideas under the Genius of the Beast, the new Bloom book, yeah. um, is that we are all part of a search engine of the cosmos. And that, and that search engine, the cosmos is constantly feeling out her possibilities. And she's feeling out her potential. And she's feeling out things she's never done before, but are just around the corner somehow. And she's feeling out that possibility space through you and me. And she does it by making us parts of a, a, a larger search engine. That larger search engine is a 
is a social search engine. It's a group search engine. And we function, I mean, I could give you the stories of the bees and I could give you the stories of the ants and I could give you the stories of the termites and how the ones at the edge are constantly probing the unknown just a little bit and then rushing back to their sisters and sharing the information out of sheer insecurity and then going back out of curiosity and probing a little bit more of the unknown. And that's what these drives force us to do, go out into the unknown a little bit, um, synthesize it in our own way, come rushing back, not in our case to our sisters, because you and I are guys, but ants are girls, um, and, uh, or bees are, um, and uh, I mean, the drones sit home and do nothing. But at <laughs> any rate, uh, the point is that, uh, that, these, that, that 20,000 or 200,000 or 2 million insects com uh, all collaborate and they share their information and they wouldn't come up with new information if they weren't driven by their own little curiosities that took them to the edge of things and a little bit beyond the edge. And these rebellious feelings of ours and these wanting to trash somebody else's ideas and distance ourselves from them and show how different we are from them and show that we deserve attention, not them, and all these little um, witchinesses of ours. They all drive us to search a little bit more of the unknown, synthesize things in our own little way, then want to come back and explain them to somebody and get some sort of validation from other people. That's our feeding what we've synthesized. It's that little tiny bit uniquely ours into the system. And you take 100 million of people doing this and feeding little bits of their own ideas into the system. And over the course of time, over the course of many generations, in fact, you get a system that really explores some bizarre new territories in astonishing new ways and creates entirely new things that never existed before. And that's how the capitalist system works. That's how the economic system works. That's how the Western system works. And that's how you and I work. Speaking of, um, of economics here... Um... I, I was uh, I was kind of thinking about the uh, the genius of the beast actually earlier today, and um, I was thinking about how you know really to to have a, a a good understanding of economics, and and I think a lot of people when they think of economics today they get a little bit bogged down in in finance and kind of you know, limit it there and just say, oh, that's that's economics. It's all finance. It's all something that people on Wall Street do. And that really doesn't have much to do with me. And, um, you know, I, I was thinking, you know, the more I was sitting there thinking about all the various transactions that happen about how much, how many exchanges take place on just a day to day basis. Like, you know, when I became aware of it, it's like, I see them everywhere. It's like, this is an exchange and this is an exchange and this is an exchange and things that we don't even think of as exchanges or, or exchanges and, and everything is capital. I mean, it almost, I mean, economics to me, it, it encapsulates so much that it's almost like, it, it's like a, you almost a term that that's so, I mean, it almost becomes vague to the point of uselessness because it encapsulates so much. It's... Because everything is an exchange. You're absolutely yeah, right. I mean, you know, I, I'm, I, reading, I, I, I'm reading Lee Smolin's uh, Three Roads to Quantum Gravity right now, and the book basically says something that I've been saying for a long time, which is why I've been attracted to Lee Smolin, which is that the entire universe is a matter of exchange. The, uh, the whole thing, long before humans were around, long before life was around, the universe was already a matter of exchange. Um, a, an electron gets together with a photon, and, uh, and, and they happen to have the same needs. I mean, one, their needs are complementary, and, and they hang around together for a long, long time. They form an atom. Uh, why? Because in some way they exchange uh, uh, mutual needs. We walk up to somebody and we say, hello, how are you? And the other person says, fine, thank you very much. That is an exchange. And there's a certain element of emotional exchange in it. And there's a certain element of what the ants do. You know, I just said the ants go out into the unknown a certain distance and they get insecure and they come back. And what do they do? They greet each other. They say, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you very much. Do you know how they say, hello, how are you? Fine, thank you very much. They have a little ritual just like we do. They rub antennae, and they tongue kiss. But they do more than tongue kiss. When they tongue kiss, they do something called trophallaxis. They cough up a little bit of what they've been eating recently into the mouth of the other. Well, is that an exchange? Yeah. Sure as hell is. It's an exchange and what happens, uh, of information. It's an exchange of information. It says, this is where I've been. This is how I've been. I mean, this is literally answering your question. How are you? Um, with the rub of the antennae, they have dust on their antennae from where they've just gone, that little bit of the unknown that they just probed. 
and they've just exchanged the chemical message about the composition of that dust with the other ant by rubbing antennae. Uh, and of course, it's an emotional exchange. It's the warmth that they're exchanging, the reassurance that they're exchanging. But then by exchanging the stuff that's in there, uh, they have a sort of carrying pouch, uh, an extra stomach. By exchanging the stuff that's in that temporary stomach, um, they're saying, and this is what I've just eaten out there. Um, nothing or something or something better than something, something yummy. I mean, you know, you know a, a cake left over from a picnic. If the message is, I've just eaten a cake left over from a picnic, guess how many other ants want to come over and exchange greetings too? <laughs> Lots. And then they want to check out the message. Where the hell did you get that, that cake? Um, and they go rushing out to follow that ants. Uh, literally, the, the trail pheromones that ant has left, the trail markers that ant has left. And if they like the cake that they found, they leave trail markers too. Just like it's a popularity contest, for God's sakes. Popularity contests are all about emotional exchanges. Popularity contests are one of the most potent things that make a collective mind work, a collective search engine work. And it's all about exchange. Everything is about exchange. So you're right. We go through exchanges all the time. We call, what a, that, what's another word for, for exchange? Trade. Huh? Trade? Isn't that the stuff they do on Wall Street? Hell yes! That's the stuff they do on Wall Street. You and I do it every freaking day. Every time we call somebody and say, oh, my God, I just had this fight with my girlfriend, and what the hell am I supposed to do? You're offering a certain amount of information that's titillating to the other person, and the other person in exchange is going to give you a certain amount of information that's going to calm you down and make you feel a little better about yourself. Ah, um, she doesn't understand. You need some control. She's a control freak, for God's sakes. Tell her to give you tell her to give you some space. Okay, that's a useful bit of reassurance, even though you've heard the phrases a million times and could have said them to yourself. Coming from another person, they mean something they didn't mean if you were just rumbling them around in your own head. They mean, oh, it's okay to feel this way. Yeah. And and it's okay is a big thing the other person is giving you. Exchange. It's all about exchange. Yeah, I, I, I find it all very fascinating. I, I love, um, you know, I, I was just thinking today about the, um, about clothing and how people uh, advertise things about their personality and... Uh, ah, yeah, the identity uh, business, <laughs> and, and the identity tools, as they're called, in the genius of the beast. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, I, I love everything that... Uh, that goes into that. I, I, I love that there's someone making money off of that. I love that there's, there's people out there who are communicating various things about themselves. Like I'm part of this group and I have uh, this sort of personality, you know, like, I mean, I can look at someone and I can judge by their clothing, you know, okay, this guy is like an overbearing belligerent jackass and he wants me to know that, you know, uh, or, you know, this is a, a very subdued person who is, you know, very serious minded because, you know, you could you could tell that sort of thing. You can't tell shit from the way I dress because at my size, you know, six, six, whatever, I have to just wear whatever the fuck fits. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, whatever tent you can crawl into. Yeah, what, whatever, uh, whatever circus tent I can, you know, uh, cut some sleeves in. Right. And, uh, you know, but other people who can choose their clothing with a little bit more uh People have a little bit more options than I do. You can you can tell a lot uh, by what they're wearing, and they want well, it, to to know. read more about to read more about everything that TJ is talking about now. Um, run right out and buy 17 copies of *The Genius of the Beast*, a radical revision of capitalism by Howard Bloom. Uh, this, by the way, was a subliminal message. You never heard it. That's great. I like that. They could read your other books too. I mean, I think there's plenty of information about that sort of stuff. Uh, Excellent. Oh yes, there is. There's tons because uh, I find probably uh, fascinating too. Probably um, uh, what was the oh, God? I, I, uh, Global Brain would be a, a probably even better for that. Um, although it, I don't know if it, it it doesn't use the term identity tools though. I don't think. But you know, there's no identity. You know, why do you always there's... reinvent your terminology for every book? It's like you know. Well, you know, I wonder that too, TJ. You know, I wonder whether I'm being absolutely insane. Wouldn't it be better? Uh, if I just repeated the same terminology over and over and over again and established a brand and left a mark in people's brains and banged it in as hard as possible so that by the time I croak, um, it is stuck in their brains indelibly. 
but um, I keep reinventing the terminology because I keep rolling over the meanings and finding different facets of similar things. So I don't know whether it works. You'd have to tell me whether it works or not uh, or whether it's just irritating. Oh, I, I, I like it, but, you know, you I would figure you'd want to do that former thing and just like, yeah, you you don't have the Republican thing going on. The Republicans are really good about language. Oh, my they, God, they're the parents. The masters, the parents. like, you know, and then they just like slam you with the language. You know, like, the Republicans can make any any Democratic thing feel dirty, like, you know, liberal. Like, I really, like, whenever I describe myself as a liberal, I have to, like, I have that little part of me that's like, ew, liberal, that's gross, you know, and then the job, the job killing, uh, what do they call the job? <laughs> the job what? killing health care bill or oh, the job killing health care bill. Right. Yes, and then amazing. But, uh, but uh, then uh, um, the other thing, I mean, and this, uh, see, this even happened uh, to me during uh, the State uh, of the uh, Union. I was I was watching the State of the Union. And Obama was talking about, uh, you know, uh, green energy or clean energy or something like that. And I had that little, the, my, the little Republican part of me was like, ew, clean energy, gross. That's horrible. That's been, I mean, like, oh, man, that's ironically, enough. That's enough. clean energy sounds dirty, kind of, you know, because of uh, well, the Republican, you know, hit job on lang- on that language. And right. They're so effective. Oh, I have that. Yeah, I, it, it, it is, it's brilliantly, but it goes back to the big lie. What Hitler, in, actual, in essence, said with the concept of the big lie is you take a simple statement, and it can be so over the top that it's absolutely ridiculous, but if you phrase it simply and you repeat it over and over and over and over and over again, people will come to believe it. In fact, the more outrageous it is, like the job-killing health care bill, the more people will believe it. And it works. The Republicans now, all they, I mean, that, it should be the party of the little mustache. Every single one of them should wear a little mustache and jerk his arm up like that every once in a while because they do have remarkable, and I shouldn't say that, but they do have remarkable party discipline. It's astonishing party discipline. And they do a much better job of phrasing things in simple terms than the Democrats do. And the Democrats are my party, for God's sake. Yeah, How but could we be so fucking inarticulate? Not, not only do they have a better better way with words uh, and phrasing things they have a better way of of demonizing things like you know they they like i i can't you can say conservative and like i can say conservative and even though i i don't like conservatives and i don't like conservative values i don't have that little part of me that goes ooh conservative you know <laughs> but when i say liberal well, we... there's like that there's that little part of me that has that instant negative reaction you know and it seems like no matter how many times i try to use the word conservative as negatively as i can to describe the most horrible people and things that i can imagine it's like i cannot get that instant ooh gross conservative i cannot get that visceral well, reaction to it from approximately 1964 until uh, Ronald Reagan, which would have been 1980, um, you would have had that feeling because the people on the left um, did a very good job of demonizing the conservatives. And conservative was a curse word right on up to about 1986. Um, But the conservatives learned everything. Well, they, they learned everything they could. They studied every technique of the left. And then they improved on every single one of them. And meanwhile, the left was so accustomed to being on top that it forgot that its language wasn't universal. It thought that its language was universal. And because it spoke the universal language of human nature, that, of course, everybody would be a a, a liberal um, Democrat, including the people in Egypt and the people in Africa and the people all over the world. And we forgot how different even the subcultures within our own culture can be. And we relaxed and we stopped competing. Um, And we have to get back into the business of competing with ideas, but we have to find some ideas worth competing for. uh, but but the idea of cutting down on health care costs, that's a simple thing we have to do. The fact that uh, Bush care um, made American cars impossible to buy around the world because um, because Bush care cost you twenty four hundred dollars per car, whereas uh, the Japanese alternative cost four hundred dollars a car and gave you better medical care. Um, Little facts like that have to be known. We have to let it be known that the Republicans are the party of, uh, of economic catastrophe, that they bring us the, a great disaster whenever you put them in charge. We have to let the world know that Ronald Reagan gutted our solar program. Um, we had the most advanced solar, I mean, under Jimmy Carter, 
Jimmy Carter may have been so dour that we couldn't stand having him around for more than one term. But the fact is, he was dead right about having the moral equivalent of war in uh, making America energy independent. And he put a lot of money into research into solar uh, power and research into wind power. And the result is that by 1980, when Ronald Reagan came around, we had the most advanced technology in solar and wind power around. Ronald Reagan gutted those programs because he was sure that oil was the future of America. Oil was the future of America. In other words, he was the biggest um, Saudi um, undercover agent this country has ever had. And he turned the country and its fortunes over to Saudi Arabia. Now, if that's not treason, God knows what is. Um, and he gutted those, because he gutted the solar program and the wind program, the Scandinavians picked up the wind programs, and as a result, they are now the leaders in providing wind technology to the world. And what technology is it? It built on the technology that was developed in the research and development labs, paid for by the government of the United States, paid for by the taxpayers of the United States. And solar power went elsewhere too. Um, in fact, the Chinese are now leading the world in solar power. Um, and, and we developed it, but Ronald Reagan gave, threw it away. He didn't just give it away, he threw it away. So the Republicans were guilty of some major, major sins. And it's time for us to tell a few more harsh truths about the Republican Party, the party of, uh, of economic catastrophe, uh, the how party you, of the uh, biggest debt in world history. Let me ask you a question. I don't know how much more time. Notice I am constantly repeating certain phrases. <laughs> yeah, I, I like I that. learned that from Mitch McConnell. Let me ask you um, this. Uh, I don't know how much, how much more time do we have. But I got to do it with my lips like this, or I can't really do a Mitch McConnell. Um, how much more time do you have here? I want to, I want to. Oh, I, I haven't even been looking at the clock because I don't have a clock in front of me. Uh, oh, I've got time. I've, well, I've got another 15 minutes. Okay, uh, I, I do have a question for you, and uh, this is about um, a very prevalent social attitude that even even people very close to me seem to have. And, um, and you know, I, I, I agree with it to a very limited extent, which is to say I don't really agree with it, but I can kind of see their point and uh you know it's a very a very a lot of people just you know very you know huge chunks of the uh the american public a lot of people just seem to think um you know what is the um what is the difference between the two parties there doesn't seem to be enough of a difference they're they're just i think of them as the same thing they're one party system that's what we have in america and i mean i don't really I don't agree with that. I, I think there's some substantive differences, but I can see how they're a little bit too close for a lot of people's comfort. Um, what is your take on that? Well, um, okay, in theory, the Republicans are the party of the past. They constantly want to drag us backwards. Um, and the Democrats should be the party of the future. But the fact is, the Democrats are the party of nothing. The Democrats don't have a program. We have the, uh, the progressive wing of the party, and the progressive wing of the party are the, the uh, red diaper kids um, whose parents were Marxists and whose parents were communists um, and who want to have a socialist system like the European system. So Sarah Palin and Mitch McConnell and, uh, and John Boehner are right about that. Um, the the uh, progressive part of our party um, wants a, uh, a social democracy. Um, now, and unfortunately, it doesn't even have a well-characterized sense of what a social democracy is. There is a simple fact that it's ignoring. The country that started using the programs like Social Security, the country that first introduced Social Security in a government medical system, was one of the most conservative nations in Europe. It was Germany under Otto von Bismarck in the 1870s. And he did it because the Marxists, the communists and the socialists had been coming on like gangbusters, and they had had revolutions in, well, uh, in 1824, I believe it was, in 1848, and he didn't want to see them succeed in another violent revolution of the kind that Marx was proposing. The result is he co-opted certain elements of the Marxist platform, and he started a government-run medical and social security operation in Germany, even though he was the ultimate warmonger and he was the ultimate um, uh, pro-dictatorship 
kind of guy. He was the ultimate right winger. Um, the result is that Germany today is the leading exporting nation of the world. The two leading exporting nations in the world are China and Germany. And Germany has what we would consider, what Mitch McConnell and what John Boehner would consider to be a socialist system. A socialist system, and it's the leading exporting nation or one of the top two leading exporting nations in the world. Surely there is a lesson we must learn here because it is the leading nation when it comes to entrepreneurialism and capitalism. And yet it has a socialist element. How the hell does it pull that off? We have to learn from that. And we, especially in the Democratic Party, who want to see a balance between government and industry, we have to learn from that. We have to be able to make the point that when, when John Boehner and Mitch McConnell say, and Eric Cantor say, that government has never contributed anything to the economic advancement of the United States, we have to point out the fact that the Internet was developed by the government, the microchip was developed using government funding, um, the, even the, the microwave the, the tube that makes a microwave uh, and a computer were invented with government funding. Now, of course, we lost the microwave in, in industry to the Japanese because we succeeded on the government level in developing the damn microwave thing. We developed it for radar for World War II, and we failed in the private sector. We failed to turn it into a product. We failed to manufacture that product. We failed so badly in the private sector in the 1970s that our entire electronic industry, which we developed, and which we developed with government research and development funding in part, went to the fucking Japanese because our private industries failed us. And Democrats have to be able to make this point. We need our private industry not to rest on its laurels, not to have a high self-image and a low achievement rate, but to really get out there and compete for God's sakes. And that's not going to happen under Eric Cantor, and it's not going to happen under John Boehner, and it's not going to happen under Mitch McConnell, because these are the people of the big lie. And we have to be able to make that case and present what our alternative is. If anything, it's the German model. We have to outcompete not just the Chinese, but the Germans. And to do that, we may have to learn a few things from them about how industry and government need to work at cross purposes sometimes, and sometimes like this, in order to make a country succeed. Remember, the message of the genius of the beast is not that unfettered free market capitalism is the answer to all of the world's problems. It's that the Western system consists of checks and balances. It consists of private industry, government, and something called the protest industry, which we have had in the Western system since 1780, a long, long time. And when those things interlock, and simultaneously compete and collaborate, we are unbeatable. Unbeatable except by the Chinese and the Germans, which means we have to learn how to take these elements, use them in balance, not do what the, the Republicans say, and only focus on the free market, because the free market by itself is as useless as a muscle in the arm without a bone, or the bone of the arm without a muscle. Those two only work if they work together. And the same is true of industry, the protest, in, uh, the protest industry, private industry, and government. They must work competitively and together simultaneously, or this system breaks down. And the Republicans are the party of the great breakdown. We Democrats must be the party of the great functionality, the great competitiveness, the great zest, the great love for the future, the great lunge into the future. Um, <clears throat> I think part Does of the make any sense. I mean, it makes sense to me. Uh, uh, the, the the problem that uh, that I think the Democrats run into, even trying to have that vision, is that it's become something like blasphemy in America to even suggest that maybe we have something to learn from anyone else because we are perfect and great and wonderful and glorious just the way we are, which. <laughs> You know that the 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 the, um, the uh, Sarah Palin idea of uh, American exceptionalism, the uh, that you know it's it's really it goes well beyond her. It pretty much infects the entire Republican Party, some of the Democratic Party. That just we are perfect. We don't need to learn anything from anyone else. We are just wonderful the way we are. We, if anything, we need to well, scale I, it, it sounds back. to me like Sarah Palin. 
sounds to me like Sarah Palin is a victim of the American educational system that says high self-image at all costs. Um, Sun Tzu, um, who is the master of tactics, will tell you that to win in a competition, you have to put yourself, you have to be able to walk in the shoes of the enemy. You have to be able to learn everything you can possibly learn about the enemy, and that's what makes you smart, and that's what puts you on top, and that's what puts you at number one, is to be able to learn every trick your enemy has ever invented and then to do it better than they do and to reinvent it so that you do something new based on it that they never even thought of. And that is what America has to do. America has to be the great synthesizer. We are the great mongrel nation. We are the nation of blacks, Asians, um, Latinos, Jews, Muslims, the whole bunch of us. And together we make this incredible melt. Together we make this incredible amalgam. And we have to be the great amalgam of the world's cultures and ideas, too. We have to steal from ideas from wherever we can. How have the Chinese managed to get so far in catching up with us, stealing every idea they could from us? How did America get its great ideas at the beginning of the 19th century? We stole our asses off. We stole the technologies of the English. The English had this top secret invention. It was so secret that you were not allowed to leave England with a sketch of it or even a verbal description of it. Do you know what it was called? The super high-tech secret? The weaving machine. The automatic cotton weaving machine. And we sent, one of, uh, we sent over a guy who pretended to be a rich doofus, just rambling around England around 1810 and taking notes in a sketchbook. And because he was such a rich adult, um, nobody took him seriously. And he came back home. Um, and he uh, and he had captured all the secrets of the weaving machines, all these top secrets, and he built weaving machines all over New England. Um, he was a member of one of the leading families. He was a member of the wait, it's the the somebody's talk only to the Lowells. He was a member of the Lowell family. You know, the Lowells talk only to the, the Cabots, and the Cabots talk only to God. Well, he was from the Lowell family. What what was the economy of Lowell, Massachusetts, based on? Cotton mills, cotton weaving machines. Cotton weaving machines formed the industrial base of the United States of America in the early 19th century. Guess who we stole the technology from? The English. Do you know why Charles Dickens refused when he was offered millions of dollars to come to America to perform? To, to, he did readings of his novels, and he was the most brilliant actor you've ever seen in your life. When he acted out the parts from those novels... They were insanely good. And we Americans wanted to see it. So we wanted him over here. And he refused at first. Do you know why he refused? No. Because he sold tons and tons and tons of books in America. But guess what? They were pirated. Not a penny of royalties was paid on any of them. <laughs> Sound like any other nation we've ever heard of? China, for example the great nation of pirates, we were the great pirates of the early 19th century. And to a certain extent, we have to go back to that attitude, knowing that you steal every secret from every competitor you can. Can a football team compete and make it to the Super Bowl without stealing every single tactic from its rivals that it possibly can and then bettering them and then improving them? No, not at all. I know nothing about football, but I can tell you that with absolute certainty. That's why football teams keep their signals as secret as they possibly can because their their competitors are trying to constantly improve strategy by stealing strategy from each other now is that correct because i know nothing about football that's 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 pretty much correct with any sport any team sport yeah that. okay well if we're so bright about it in sports we better be even brighter about it when it comes to economics it seems it like our it, you know. It seems like in a, in America, and I don't I don't know if um, I mean I obviously haven't been around as long as you have, but it seems like at, at least today there there's this uh, air of um, untouchable. You know, like like there, there's, it it seems like it's almost afforded the same status as religion uh, nationalism in America. There's uh, this idea oh, that you, you you know you can't you can't question country. Um, well, you know at least there the, the it seems like the Republicans propagate that idea when when uh, one of them is in office, and then afterwards it's okay to question the president, just not the rest of the country. But um, 
Well, but here's here's a, a new phrase. How do we? How do we? How, well, I, my question is, how do we break through that? How do we say, you know, it's okay for us to to question this? It's okay for us to change the way things are done. It's okay for us to keep moving forward when you have. But America is block America is the nation. America is the nation of questioning itself. America is the nation of challenging itself. America is the nation of the protest industry. America is the nation of self-correction. America is the nation of self-criticism. America is the nation where we have freedom of debate. America is the nation where we have freedom of speech. America is the nation where we have freedom to challenge each other and even to challenge ourselves. And we are not using that freedom. And if we are not using that freedom, we are not being Americans. Arrogance is a pleasure you have to earn. I agree with you 100%, but it, it just seems like there's this huge block of Americans now that just they, they view it as sacrilege if you if you dare question certain aspects of our culture or if you uh, or if you even or if you endorse any sort of change whatsoever. It just seems like there you know it's it's becoming increasingly um, tantam. I mean, like you know the, the you it, it seems like no. I mean, I, I, that's obviously part of the reason why, uh, you know, you and I view us as falling behind the rest of the world, because it seems like, you know, we're not embracing our our uh, our legacy of being the uh, the rogues of uh, of constantly pushing the boundaries. It seems like we've become sort of stagnant. How do we snap out of that? Well, first of all, those who sit on their ass to use Glenn Beck's kind of phraseology, those who sit on their ass are traitors to the American spirit. Um, those who are smug are traitors to the American spirit. Those who want to sit in place and pat themselves on the back for accomplishing absolutely nothing, those are the people who are going to destroy America. Those are un-American people. They are violently un-American people. Now look, we should not be stigmatizing anybody as un-American because America has room for all kinds of people and all kinds of opinions. But the fact is, people who drag us down and drag us into the muck and drag us backwards are going to destroy us. And we can't afford to destroy, we can't afford to be destroyed. We can't be de afford to be destroyed for the sake of those who are industrious, for the sake of those who are never satisfied, for the sake of those who are constantly striving forward, for the sake of those who are constantly lunging toward the future, for the sake of those who are constantly making the future. And we can't afford to be laggards even for the sake of those who lag because they will suffer the most if we go down.